really a pleasure to um, be here um, and talking about measuring and improving uh, quality in primary health care um, through a global lens. And um, part of the reason um, I think Florian invited me here today is as a, a prior executive director of PHCPI, the Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative, um, and our work in trying to measure primary health care. Um, and uh, with that project included, I'll be sharing uh, work that we did as part of the initiative, but certainly um, what I have to say no longer represents um, any uh, individual member of the initiative um, or necessarily the initiative's perspective as a whole. Um, and I'll be sharing a little bit of my own personal perspective um, as we move along uh, in the conversation. Um, just to share in terms of uh, conflicts of interest, um, I work at Boston University, um, was uh, employed by PHCPI, as I mentioned, um, and currently have some grants uh, supported by Shinkong Life Foundation, Shinkong Hospital, JNK Wonderland Foundation, Gets and the Man in Trust. Um, and I'm the current president of the North America region of WACA, the World Organization of Family Doctors. Um, so a couple of things I hope uh, you'll walk away with is um, really being able to describe some of the measurement issues um, in primary health care, um, outlining key considerations in relation to primary health care quality, uh, and uh, uh, being able to apply some of these lessons uh, to your own work. Uh, and of course, you know, I think the, the conversation always starts um, with primary health care in Almada and um, the vision of how primary health care might bring us to universal health coverage. Um, and I think that um, created uh, this perspective that I've put up here, I think of what primary health care um, was envisioned um, around that time. And, and I've adapted this from a a colleague of mine in Vietnam, and um, what you see here is sort of the building blocks that potentially build this house of primary health care, um, ideally what it should look like. Um, I've gone ahead and taken elements that are strongly dependent in primary health care and shaded them darker and green, um, and left the ones that are less dependent on um, primary care um, in the lighter color. And, you know, I think basic treatment and essential drugs um, in healthcare is really the the core elements of that and then different aspects um, cross over more strongly into to primary care or not. Um, but I think that in reality, what we really found um, over those uh, 40 years is something closer to this, right? So um, basic treatment and, medic uh, and medications were not um, available in the way that they needed to be. And so we end up with this uh, mishmash of disorganized and ineffective service delivery. Um, I think another way to kind of replicate that is, is this vision, right? And so what we moved towards was developing this vertically oriented systems, as we see on the left, where people fit into those silos. I think what, from a primary healthcare perspective, we ideally want to see integrated care um, to the individual on the right, when what we most often have is this kind of disjointed, broken, not quite... Um, uh functioning uh frontline primary health care system uh to share a little bit about phcpi and and um and who we were uh we were a partnership dedicated to transforming the global state of primary health care we were focused on catalyzing improvement through better measurement of primary health care um and the partnership consisted of the bill and melinda gates foundation the world bank who unicef the global fund um, together with technical partners, our ADNI labs, and results for development. Uh, and really, I think the core belief of our work was PHC as the foundation to achieving UHC, um, that it really is uh, necessary to get to universal health coverage. Um, and it's the key to being to build up uh, the human capital that's necessary over the life cycle um, to really build economic growth for countries. And the, the first thing PHCPI tried to do is really looking at uh, the various frameworks that were out there and trying to, to see um, if there were things that were already adequate for uh, measuring primary health care. And, um, and particularly um, what we could do in terms of um, clarifying the elements of service delivery. So looking at a lot of the traditional measurement frameworks didn't really have any focus on service delivery. 
Um, some of the recent scorecards around that time had more. And the intent of PHCPI was really to try and unpack uh, the elements of service delivery and those systems in inputs that influence them and how those influence outputs and outcomes. And so PHCPI came out with um, this initial uh, primary healthcare framework uh, where you see here the, the system uh, inputs on the left, um, this much larger unpacked uh, section of service delivery, um, as well as then some potential outputs and outcomes, and really tried to um, establish this construct for thinking about um, how we might uh, measure and improve primary health care. One of the challenges that we ran into with that was um, we then went hunting for globally comparable and available indicators that we could use to measure all of these domains and just found enormous data gaps. Um, as you see here, only 11 of the 19 subdomains that we had identified as being important to primary health care had any uh, data at all. Uh, and so uh, what we next moved to is really trying to develop a dashboard that we could use a snapshot for um, showing where systems are strong and where there are challenges and um, how we could provide this in a fairly easily digestible way um, to quickly be able to um, look at the overall performance of a health system and primary health care and, and then look at how we take deeper dives. And we really organized this uh, snapshot around four different pillars, financing, capacity, performance, and equity. Uh, we started with uh, financing, uh, recognizing that financing um, was really necessary as a base foundation uh, in order for the health system to function effectively. And really we didn't have um, any uh agreed upon uh global measures for uh, measuring primary health care expenditures uh when we started and so who took on the effort of trying to be able to come up with a um, standardized way of using uh the system of health accounts from 2011 to be able to try and measure primary health care and so the things that we wanted to know about was how much was being spent on primary health care so we started looking at um, amounts per capita. Um, we uh, were interested in how spending on primary health care is being prioritized. So looking at overall health spending and how much government health spending uh, was being uh, committed to primary health care, as well as what the sources are uh, that were funding primary health care, how much was coming from the government, how much was coming from other sources. And all of this happens in the context of how much the government's spending on health overall. Uh, in system capacity, uh, we looked at governance, inputs, population health and facility management. We wanted to know do po policies prioritize primary health care. Are there enough staff, facilities, and drugs? And do facilities know their population? Do they promote good teamwork? Are they well managed? Um, and we looked at a variety of different aspects that relate to this. Um, one of the challenges that we faced in the area of capacity was that we didn't have um, a lot of globally comparable uh quantitative indicators to be able to use and so we developed this primary health care progression model um, using mis mixed methods both qualitative and quantitative data to then score different uh aspects of uh, these different subdomains against a rubric uh working with the country um, and doing some external validation to try and come to an agreement on what the actual performance of the system was in those areas uh, and there were 33 different measures as part of that um, set of rubrics for this capacity domain in the primary health care uh, progression model. Um, and here you can see sort of what these rubrics look like. This is a priority setting rubric. You see here on the left, there's three different components, uh, the degree to which data is used to set priorities, the proportion of priority setting exercises, the frequency at which uh, resources are based on results of priority setting exercise and you score each of those on a level one two three or four um, and the overall score is whatever the lowest uh, performing area is in that area um, recognizing it's probably difficult for most systems to be performing above um, the category that's at the lowest rating 
Um, and with that, we gave a, a host of different uh, detailed guiding questions where you could find data sources to try and fill in this data de novo that didn't exist. Um, both of those, the capacity domain and the performance domain, uh, had these page twos. So you could click through that initial snapshot to see the more detailed breakdown of the various um, scorings. Um, as I mentioned, that, that third section is that system performance that looked at access quality and service coverage, quality being one of the things we're particularly interested in today. Um, could patients get care with minimal financial barriers or travel? Could staff diagnose and treat basic conditions? Are patients able to receive a wide range of essential services? Um, again, looked at various um, individual aspects of these access related to financial and geographic barriers, quality looked at a number of those core primary care functions, but not all of them, um, in addition to a few other elements. And then we looked at coverage, which was not um, necessarily quality service coverage, um, but just the presence overall. Uh, and this is the range of those various scores um, that make up the performance domain. Finally, uh, the last column was system equity because we were really interested in was if uh, primary health care uh, is in fact strong and functioning well, we expect that um, health disparities should diminish. Uh, and so we really felt it as an outcome measure, it was really important to have some specific measures of quality that looked at these kinds of disparities. Um, and so we want to know, you know, are the most vulnerable seeing results, uh, we split looked at access by wealth quintile, coverage of uh, services by mother's education, and uh, under five mortality by urban versus rural um, residents. And then we had also some broader context measures looking at whether the system's achieving good results or not. Um, one of the other things that we also did when we developed a snapshot was because we recognized this um, huge lack of data, we really wanted countries to be able to use whatever available data they had. So even if we couldn't find globally comparable sources, we were willing to accept local sources that compromised the country to country comparability um, in order to make these scorecards um, as useful as possible to the countries themselves. And so allowing them to use as much of the data um, that they have as possible to be able to substitute for um, some of these other measures, assuming that it's a, a reasonable substitute. Uh, and ultimately, we finished uh, with 28 uh, countries with vital signs profiles, uh, as you see here, um, as we uh, closed in on the conclusion of PHCPI uh, at the end of last year. Now, um, one of the next big things was really thinking about, okay, once um, Alma Ada uh, and transitioned into the declaration from Astana um, and WHO's um, broader perspective on primary health care, looking at the three pillars of multi sectoral policy and action, empower people and communities, um, and primary care and essential public health functions, was um, how we could uh, begin to better integrate the uh, work from PHCPI with the work that was coming out of um, WHO. And again, our focus really being on this primary care and essential public health functions, the service delivery elements of primary health care. Um, and so uh, WHO uh, developed the primary health care measurement framework and indicators. We worked with them to uh, support their development of a globally endorsed framework and set of indicators that could be used um, for trying to uh, measure primary health care. Uh, and as people may have seen before, um, this is a conceptual framework. You'll see in a lot of ways, it looks um, similar in terms of structures, inputs, processes, and outputs um, to uh, the work of PHCPI. We have things like the quality of care, the models of care um, in that service delivery element you see in the middle. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the different indicators, but this is the range of indicators um, and there's global indicators, uh, tier one and tier two indicators to sort of um, to help countries be able to identify um, which indicators might be most useful to them um, and which might be most important for looking at global comparability. 
Uh, and I think there's some really interesting and unique elements of things in the WHO set of measures that we did not have in PHCPI. So for instance, we did not have a strong focus, I think, on um, workforce issues in PHCPI. We had kind of a more general element. And I think um, WHO um, thought more carefully about um, how they might be able to bring in some new measures like uh, density of film as and practitioners per 100,000 population is sort of a um, sub indicator that could be particularly helpful as we're thinking about performance of systems and and i'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, the thing that actually i'm most excited about it um, PCPI's work was um, the last few months uh, in that. Uh, it's unfortunate we didn't have more time to promote it, but going into the very last um, weeks and days of um, PHCPI's work, uh, we released a PHC Digital Hub, and you see here at phcdigitalhub.improvingphc.org. And if you haven't been there to check it out, I would really highly encourage folks to go see it. Um, as you see here, this is a snapshot of the overview page, maybe a little hard for you to see, but um, the gist here is that um, we then started trying to develop a second generation vital signs profile that was better aligned with this new um, framework and indicators from WHO. Um, again, there's many indicators in that set, so we were looking at sort of a subset that was a little more uh, closely related to service delivery um, for that vital signs profile. And these are the various subdomains you see across the board. Um, and uh, if you go to this page, you can uh, see the various subdomains. And the nice thing here is it shows a bit of the upstream uh, elements as well as the uh, downstream elements and how they're influenced. So um, here you can see management of services is what's highlighted here. And then it shows some things like uh, PHC workforce that are upstream, as well as um, uh, primary care functions being downstream elements that are related to the management of services. Um, you can click through then that management of services element to see and learn more about that uh, piece. So you can see the various indicators that are um, contributing to the measurement of management of health services, and you can look through and specifically find the metadata related to uh, those elements. Uh, if you scroll down further, you can find a, a layout of the related concepts, and each of these little pluses you can click through to see more detail on PHC workforce and how that relates to management of services. Um, scroll a little bit further down the page, you also can find improvement strategies. So, and this goes on and on. This is just one uh, snapshot of that, but it's really a whole host of um, uh, lessons and elements related to the management of health services that you could think about if you're trying to make improvements in that area in your health system. Um, and then at the very bottom of that page, we in addition have a whole host of potential funding opportunities related to that category of work. So these are all different programs that are um, looking to support um, work in that particular area. So um, giving countries and others an opportunity to, to try and find folks um, that might be able to support their work in that area. Um, and then last but not least is the new second generation vital signs profile that we developed using Power BI um, that uh, really is very closely aligned uh, and based off of the new WHO um, framework and indicators. Uh, and um, unfortunately, we haven't released, these are all mock uh, countries that are currently available on the website. However, um, you can go through and actually download an Excel um, file for data entry. You can get the beta version of um, the data visualization with the Power BI platform, and you can use that to actually generate your own um, uh, vital signs profile, which is really something that we were not doing before. So we've really democratized this in a way that anybody can access it, use it, and iterate from it. Um, below this, there are sort of a set of technical guidelines and expectations in terms of how to um, apply citations and so forth to the use of that work, but, but it really is available for anybody to be able to, to access and um, fill in. You know, a couple of um, take-home lessons from our 
uh, work with the first generation of vital signs profiles, those um, 28 countries where we did um, those initial vital signs profiles, when we had about 23, we um, started to look and see what were the lessons that we could take away from the data that we'd collected so far. Um, looking at um, the PHC spending, we found that less than half of PHC spending came from government sources in low and middle income countries that out-of-pocket spending uh, comprised a substantial portion of the other sources for funding primary health care. Um, and so really efforts to strengthen financing um, need to not focus solely on increasing overall spending, but also um, looking at where those sources of funding are coming from. Uh, we also looked at the capacity domain, uh, and you see here population health and facility management, government and inputs. Um, and as you see here, this is um, the higher score is sort of at the top and the lower scores at the bottom. Um, in population health facility management um, and inputs, we still have a lot of red on this graph. So a lot of countries that are still performing um, in a quite low um, scoring area of the rubric. Um, governance, I think countries overall are doing a bit better as you can see. Um, but as we return to inputs, again, things like workforce density and distribution at the bottom of that um, are really not scoring very well. When it comes to quality, um, really major gaps remain here. Um, the biggest and most significant finding I would point out here is that only 45% of the quality indicators in the vital signs profile had data available. So less than half of all the measurement areas across all the countries had data to measure quality. And in general, the quality wasn't great. Um, nearly a third of people reported substantial barriers um, to access, that barely over half of all people received necessary recommended services. And that, again, was not looking at um, high quality services. That was just looking at their presence. And the best performing country barely topped out at 70%. So when you look at sort of how these countries were performing, and that's only in the countries that we had data for, you know, it's reasonable to expect the countries that aren't reporting data are potentially performing um, even less well uh, than the countries that are reporting. So, you know, we definitely have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, primary health care quality. And then finally, looking at um, the uh, equity component, um, I think the big takeaway here was, you know, you look at one element of equity and you've seen one element of equity. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it doesn't seem like disparities carry um, necessarily across different areas. So it's really important to be looking at a range of the different disparities, monitoring those as a whole, and then finding targeted ways to deal with each of those um, individually. And our final take home from looking at all of this was really that um, every country has a unique fingerprint in how they're performing in terms of primary health care. And so um, doing these measures is really um, important and helpful to countries to be able to identify where are the areas that they want to be able to um, invest and spend time and effort. You know, some of the challenges ahead that I personally would identify um, moving forward here in terms of primary health care, um, there's so many indicators. Um, and we really still have a lack of guidance or on prioritization, you know, what's most important for countries to measure, um, what's most important for them to be focusing on for improvement, it, you know, primary at PHCPI, we never really got to providing that level of guidance. And I think that's something that we still need. And there's still so little data. We're still awaiting a release of the PHCMFI collection tools from WHO. And, and um, certainly uh, we can hear if there's, uh, if those are on the horizon or about to be released or if, any of those have been released so far, but those are really critical elements to us being able to populate this new um, set of indicators and, um, and this framework for primary health care. Um, simultaneously, the World Bank has collected as much data as they could scrape for this new vital signs uh, profile second generation tool, um, but that also isn't released yet. So we're still waiting for them to, to release their data repository that would allow um folks like you here that might be downloading that tool and trying to populate or generate a vital science profile to use um, globally available data in a, a structured way 
And finally, I think, you know, even once we know the what, countries are really lacking guidance on the how or the what now, right? Once we have this, this data, what's the next step? And for this, I step back a bit to, you know, looking at some of the data as well as my personal experience of primary care development globally. Um, the, the problem remains the same, that many still lack access to basic health care. We look at PHC in many countries, we're dealing with old or poorly equipped facilities, lack of diagnostic capacity, not enough medications, staff that aren't trained in core primary care functions, and financial and geographic barriers. And so we really need to figure out how to bolster um, the uh, improvement in these various areas so that we get good basic frontline service delivery. Um, and, you know, I think workforce is really a key element of this. Um, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. If we look at um, WHO's uh, data from during the pandemic, you know, the biggest barriers to accessing COVID-19 tools and three of these graphs you see here, health workforce challenges were the top list um, and bottleneck in terms of being able to address that. And it's not just uh, low and middle income countries that are facing this problem. OECD is facing issues as well. We see that the shared generalist medical practitioners has been dropping over the last two decades. This is before COVID um, across the majority of OECD countries. And almost certainly this data is worse now. Um, I think another key element is, you know, looking at the um, Lancet Commission on high quality health systems um, reinforces again some of these principles and the measurements that we're seeing. Adherence to evidence based guidelines diagnostic accuracy, the performance in these areas is quite poor right you're seeing maybe 50% adherence to evidence based guidelines on average diagnostic accuracy is similar. Uh, I mean that's a coin flip uh, that is not a good uh, quality based outcome. Uh, user experience, we're looking at respect, communication, um, time spent, wait time, all of these things have significant room for improvement hovering around, you know, 60-70%. And then, of course, what we all saw in the pandemic, uh, lack of confidence and trust in the health system really damaged our ability to be able to apply um, effective public health strategies to managing the pandemic. Um, seeing, you know, here, trust and belief that the system works pretty well, um, you know, what 20 to 30 percent there quite low um so a lot of of work to do and then grounded in my experience um working in various countries throughout um southeast asia and some in africa um you know to me really it comes back to these core primary care functions uh those elements of first contact accessibility comprehensiveness people-centeredness coordination continuity of care this is the glue that holds together um, primary care, and we just really aren't effectively measuring very well. Um, in my work, uh, we've tried to use a primary care assessment tool from Barbara Starfield as one of the core elements has been used globally quite widely for trying to measure these elements, but really hasn't gained the kind of global uptake that would be necessary to make it effective. Um, and it's really these principles that are the foundation of our understanding of why primary healthcare works. Um, you know, if we look at some of that uh, earlier data from Barbara Starfield, um, you know, one of the most interesting studies to me um, was this one looking at the increase in the number of primary care physicians being associated with a decrease in mortality, and that the effect was greatest if it was family physicians. And, um, you know, I've seen this slide, this is directly from Barbara's slides, uh, you know, one more family physician per 10,000 uh was associated with 70 fewer deaths per 100,000. And what I got to thinking about, so what does that mean, 70 fewer deaths? I I didn't really have a good what are the global mortality numbers um to get a sense of, you know, how does the application of one more family doctor per 10,000 um impact overall health? So what I did was and and you can fault me a little bit for there's lies, damn lies and statistics. So they were going to go into the statistics end of it um category but i think just for like general conceptualization of what we're talking about this was helpful to me so i went back to the um mwr to look at uh what the mortality numbers were like so this is from um barbara's study looking at here you see the the family medicine line this was back in 80 85 90 95 this is quite old data but still uh i think compelling um 
what does it mean for a, a level in this case in 1995, 38.7 per 100,000 reduction in mortality? Well, that was the equivalent of um, saving as many or more lives each year um, than the total of those killed by all infectious diseases combined at that time in the US. Like, it's hard to imagine a um, intervention that could be more significant than that. And you can start, you know, just playing around to look and say, you know, what kinds of things are we talking about? Adding a family doc would have been better than eliminating 25% of all heart disease, 30% of all cancer, better than eliminating all cerebral vascular disease, twice as good as eliminating all asthma and emphysema. Um, and, you know, you can go on and on, right? You can look at kidney disease, liver disease, HIV. I mean, it's, it, it, um, it's an incredibly powerful um, potential intervention for health systems. Uh, and we know it also helps reduce costs. So um, you can see here the, the red dotted line is the, the cost of care um, that as the percentage of generalist physicians uh, goes up, that cost of care goes down. Now, at the same time, healthcare outcomes don't continue to climb. At some point, we plateau. We don't have enough um, specialist to be able to manage and, and things start to dip off. But there is sort of a, a um, point at which that 40 to 50 percent where things level off, we know we're getting maximum value uh, out of our health systems with the right number of generalists. Um, for me and my work, as I started thinking about how do we approach um, primary care system strengthening and that question of the how or the what next, um, I think it's really critical that as we're thinking about improving health systems and primary health care that we're thinking across three broad pillars. We can't just be looking at capacity building. We can't just be looking at clinical services. We can't just be looking at policy and advocacy. We need to try and figure out how to move all three of these areas of work forward. Um, and I think there's a trajectory to how um, these areas get developed. Um, and that's shown here sort of looking at how capacity building clinical services policy and advocacy move and i think looking at these different measures that we're talking about you can then start to take a, a construct like this and begin to look at where your country is on this trajectory of development and what are the things that you've already accomplished and what are the things that still need to move forward and i think the maturity models um, that who is developing and the progression model the phcpi has done um, tries to provide some of that similar uh, perspective, all with the goal of trying to get us to that ultimate SDG goal of ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. Um, to, to close out with my personal perspective in terms of we have all these indicators, um, how do we start thinking about what to prioritize? Um, you know, uh, taking my personal experience, what we've learned, um, scrolling through some of these elements, I think it's really important that we start thinking globally and not just me, but um, bringing thought experts together uh, around the world to think about, you know, really what are those most critical elements? My perspective, I think policies oriented to primary health care are a really key element. Um, we need to look at the existence of policies for community-based centers or providers who are empowered to provide um, care for undifferentiated populations that are unrestricted by age, gender, disease, or organ system. We need to look at expenditures. Um, we need to monitor spending on PHC, but we also need um, more effective ways of looking at that. Uh, we're really lacking a lot of context for those broader measures that I shared from PHCPI. We need to understand more about how money is being spent in terms of the location of service delivery, the accurate allocation of pharmaceutical costs, a huge portion of that um, comes directly from pharmaceutical costs that have been allocated to primary health care um, as being uh, relevant, and it's a fairly arbitrary number. So we, we really need to get crisper on that. Uh, physical infrastructure, density and distribution of health facilities, I think is really critical, and not any health facilities, but those that really can provide um, undifferentiated care on the front lines. Uh, I think health workforce is really critical. Um, we can have the best medications, the best diagnostics in place. If we don't have um, a health workforce that knows how to use those effectively and to be able to use those in a context that brings together the public health principles that we're um, hoping to 
um, extend to the population, uh, then we're really not going to make progress. And so, um, you know, for me, if I could only choose two things, I would look at family doctors and professionalized community health workers, um, unrestricted by age, gender, disease, organ system. Um, Cause I think those are sort of the two ends of the spectrum. Um, and we need both of those to have a complete health workforce. I think it'd be ideal to also be looking at clinical officers, advanced practitioners and nurses that also have any amount of training that's specific to those core primary care functions. Um, we need to look at quality and competency, things like the diagnostic accuracy, adherence to clinical standards, and also use of supportive supervision, which I don't think we think about enough. Um, and ideally, we'd include something on provider motivation. I think we need to look at medicines, health products, infrastructure. This is pretty basic. Do we have the availability of essential medications for the top 20 local diagnoses? Do we have availability of tracer diagnostics for the top 20 local diagnoses? And do we have the availability of basic equipment necessary for frontline undifferentiated care? For primary care functions and models of care, I think looking at first contact access, are there mechanisms in place that promote first contact accessibility? Comprehensiveness, how many facilities are able to treat those top 20 diagnoses for an area? Um, how many are meeting minimum standards to deliver tracer services related to those? and ideally an outcomes index related to those 20 local um, top diagnoses problems or, or health needs. And most importantly, we really need to be looking at the primary care functions and how we're doing that. So the percent of facilities that are using health records for, um, for informational continuity, measures of interpersonal longitudinal continuity with providers, and are, are we, using an impanelment system to be able to track our patients for population health management. Um, coordination of care, protocols for patient referral, counter referral, emergency transfer, communication collaboration between facility-based, community-based providers. And then for patient centers and responsiveness to people, I think we've been talking a lot about patient reported experiences, perceptions of the health system and services, but I also think there's an element to patient centeredness that we don't always think about, which is really, um, measurement of performance and outcomes related to multimorbidity. Each person is an individual system. I think that's in fact one of the things that makes um, primary care service delivery so effective in those improvement mortality numbers is that those are those are the providers that have expertise in dealing with you as an individual and the multimorbidity that you face. There was really no other aspect of the health system that's prepared to deal with that. Um, and I think we really need to think more carefully about how we're measuring that um, to better understand uh, that process. Um, so that's uh, my uh, brief take on primary healthcare measurement and the work that we've done at PHCPI and um, in the world that's to come and, and how we think about trying to, to narrow and prioritize the, um, the elements that uh, are so important to primary healthcare. Thank you, thank you a lot, Jeff. This is really an amazing, really exciting presentation. And also, of course, congratulations to everything you did for PHCPI. Um, yeah, I mean, coming to these groups a lot, we we sort of talk about why primary care and family physicians aren't sort of considered sometimes not even proper doctors, you know, and, you know, you have um, presented a very, very compelling argument as to why family physicians are important, particularly in terms of outcomes and, you know, some of the statistics you presented, but, you know, why it isn't that adopted throughout many countries? Certainly, I feel it in my own country of the UK that uh, we aren't considered, I mean, uh, you know, we, we we have a lot of negative media, but certainly I think a lot of um, con um, discussions that we've had in the past throughout the world you know there is this sort of negativity around family physicians etc and I, I just wonder if you had any thoughts about why governments and policy isn't so positive for for family physicians when you there's this very compelling message of how you can improve health so significantly by increasing the numbers yeah i think um I mean, A, I think it just feels daunting. I think it feels huge. You know, when you're looking at a 6 million health worker gap in Africa by 
2030. I mean, everybody's like, how do we possibly accomplish that? Um, I, but I think that's because we haven't really had good systematic ways of trying to address that. And, you know, my work in Vietnam, I think over the, the 10 years that we worked together, we um, spent about $10 million. We trained over a thousand family doctors and um, set up ongoing training programs that continue to train family doctors to this day in every university in the country. So, you know, a really meaningful way to help a country build the infrastructure to get to scale up. And from my perspective, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Like for, for donors, um, that's something that should be really critical to invest in, right? That it is hard for countries to get over that hump, to build that infrastructure, to put that money forward, to get them to that place. With donor support, they could get in, te in technical support that also is brought in to, to help them in that process. They could get to that process of, of scale and then they can maintain. And that's a much more achievable and affordable thing to move forward with. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's sort of the, the healthcare moonshot um, for health systems is, you know, we really need to be aiming for fixing that healthcare gap. We don't get that healthcare worker gap underway. All this public health stuff that we're trying to, to develop and put into these frameworks, none of it's gonna amount to very much because there's just nobody providing front, basic frontline quality care. Yeah, thank you a lot for this great question and for your comment as well. And thank you a lot for your time, of course. And now it's a big pleasure to continue with Sham Said. And also afterwards, we might have the opportunity to ask also questions to Bob Phillips. So also welcome Bob Phillips, of course, here as well, because we asked him especially to join. Yeah, thanks, Gloria. So colleagues, it's fascinating to hear all of the points that have been made by Jeff and many of those points uh, um, are very clearly articulated within his presentation. But uh, the question that um, was posed to, to me was really focusing in on what WHO is doing in relationship to quality of care. And it was really great to hear Jeff's um, um, expansion on various aspects of quality of care issues. Um, and particularly referring back to the Lancet Commission's work and just reminding ourselves that back in 2018, there were actually three really important global reports on quality of care. One was the Lancet Commission's work, and then the second was the WHO World Bank OECD report, and then the third was the National Academies of Sciences report. Now, all of those three pointed to the criticality of looking at access and quality uh, uh, together. And I think you know all of you would know very well the um, the operational framework for primary healthcare. But if you um, notice that the systems for improving the quality of care is one of the pillars of the operational levers, um, operational lever number twelve. Um, important to emphasise that, of course, while this is a lever for change, that quality of care is embedded within many of the levers. Um, and um, Jeff already alluded to policy level work um, that's really critical to consider here. Um, and so when we look at the PHC results that we're focusing in on in terms of improving access, utilization and quality, we do need to focus particularly on interventions on quality of care. And if you can see here, um, the WHO has been working quite clearly on this one particularly focusing in on the planning side. And one of the things that's emphasized in the PHC operational framework is that multi-level planning that's required at national, subnational, and facility level, and also on the action side. Um, and the reason why I was keen to just give you that small flavor of the planning side is that while we undergo those PHC movements, we do need to think about quality planning um, starting from the facility level, but making sure that those quality improvement efforts are linked to district level efforts and national level efforts, um, and taking into consideration foundational requirements and guiding principles, all of which I think uh, general practitioners, multidisciplinary teams working in primary care know very, very well. But it's important to bring that to light in terms of this multi-level planning. Um, and WHO has released, and this is basic, uh, this is built on a 10 country 
effort focusing in initially on maternal newborn child health. Um, and this planning guide has been focusing in on how to institutionalize that for the longer term. And hand in hand with that planning guide is the WHO quality toolkit. And I was particularly keen for this group to have full um, access and knowledge of the WHO quality toolkit because it is the go-to um, related to quality of care tools come, emerging from WHO. And before its release, and it was released with, the, with some opening remarks from Dr. Tedros, before its release, we were in the situation where if you wanted to find out about maternal and newborn child health and quality of care related to that, you'd have to try and find it somewhere. If you wanted to find out about TB and HIV, you'd have to find it somewhere. And if you wanted to take it from a systems lens, then you'd have to find it somewhere. This has changed that and it's organized. And I will place um, the link so you can play with it. Um, and we do have an orientation uh, webinar that you could also um, take a look at. Again, em emphasizing here, this national, subnational facility and community level, and thinking also through what is required in national strategic direction setting on quality. I think uh, Jeff already alluded to the critical importance of policy level work, but that has to be hand in hand, of course, with an understanding of improvement efforts at the facility level, what's working, what's not working. So these um, uh, resources are categorized based on these different levels for ease of access. And I just wanted to just last point before coming to any key questions here is um, of course the work that PHCPI has done has been phenomenal. And Jeff has already alluded to the primary healthcare measurement framework and indicators. Um, one thing to really emphasize here is when we're looking at this, thinking about quality of care in a cross cutting way, which is what, um, and if you, flick through um, page 28 of this document, you'll see that we really emphasize quality of care as cross-cutting and taking through all the way from health system determinants to service delivery, all the way to outcomes and impact. So that's a real point of emphasis to make is that when we are thinking about quality of care issues, we really should be thinking um, holistically in systems for improving quality of care. And that's a, a bit of an innovation there within that measurement framework is that there is a specific reference to systems for improving quality of care at the facility level, which is something that needs further attention. And Jeff, in answer to your question, as um, tools emerge from WHO, and we were actually just in a quality technical expert network meeting earlier this um, afternoon, that will then be populated within the quality toolkit and that allows us all to take the necessary action. I, it's a very short intervention, Florian, you had asked me just to, for a quick five to seven minutes, so there you go. Thank you a lot. This was really, really helpful, useful, and interesting for us. And I would like to follow up with a um, kind of practical question, because you mentioned the WHO Quality Toolkit. What are, in your minds, the key WHO technical resources um, countries could use for quality and primary healthcare and universal health coverage? Yeah. So our, our go-to, Florian, is really our PHC operational framework, right? So looking very carefully and at that and thinking through what is mentioned within the lever on systems for improving quality of care. That's our entry point. When you go into that, then if you widen the lens, then you come across really a host, a range of resources that you can use. I want to maybe highlight a few. So first, setting national strategic direction on quality of care, something that um, countries are doing across the world, low-income low country settings, middle-income country settings, high-income country settings. Setting national strategic direction on quality is also now an agreement within WHO and ministries of health to take that forward. So that's the National Quality Policy and Strategy Handbook that many of you may be familiar with is something that would be a key resource to consider. Second is when we talk about standards of care, the Quality Toolkit provides a one-stop shop on standards of care. So of course, looking at that standards of care and thinking through 
not just the measurement side, because of course, and Jeff's a measurement expert also, so I, I'm always hesitant to speak on that, but essentially no measurement without improvement. So improvement and measurement coming hand in hand. And within that improvement side, there are a few key guidance documents within the quality toolkit on, improvement, on improvements related to specific population groups, specific diseases, specific issues, but then taking it all holistically within a systems-based approach. So those are the types of resources. I'll pop it into the chat in terms of um, direct access, because you can also search for key resources that you're looking for in terms of taking action on quality of care. Yeah, thank you a lot. And um, my next question would be, which actually, which particular challenges do you see in relation to quality of primary healthcare all over the world? That's a great question as well, um, Florian. But I think one of the things that I'd highlight there is the fragmentation related to quality of care efforts. That's an ask that can be a difficulty, but we recognize that pathfinders for quality of care have been taken by disease-focused programs and population-focused programs. We need to build on that. But one of the things that we recognize is that there needs to be a holistic approach to quality of care that's designed with intention and understanding of frontline realities. So for example, if we're talking about water sanitation and hygiene, you'll find in the quality toolkit, there are resources related to um, first steps related to water sanitation and hygiene. It's very difficult to speak about quality of care issues in a, a healthcare facility that does not have running water or energy. So these are the types of things that we have as structural issues. Of course, there are huge issues related to processes, but then all of that has to be considered in a holistic way. And that's why I come back to the issue related to setting national strategic direction on quality of care with a very clear PHC lens. Uh, yeah, thank you very much you. For, for these uh, very important uh, contributions. And I think, um, yeah, I'm very, very much also uh, in favor of the fact that we look also at the dimension of person centeredness of the care, the primary health care. I think uh, if we don't uh, make our primary health care as person centered as possible, we will not uh, achieve our most important aim that's uh, winning the trust and the hearts and the minds of our people, because that's what we mainly can do at primary care level. And we know, I've seen in COVID and so on, how much we need this trust in your health system. And the trust in your health system goes through the trust in the individual providers and especially those in primary care. So I think that's a major investment for the sustainability of our health system in general and primary care more in detail. And there I think that it is important, certainly when it comes to multimorbidity and dealing with chronic conditions, that we focus on a kind of paradigm shift from disease-oriented care towards uh, goal-oriented care, where we start from the life goals of the person and then see how with our knowledge, with our evidence, we can contribute to achieve the life goals of that person. If we manage to do that, it will have a positive effect, not only at the level of healthcare, but also at the level of social cohesion and connectedness in society. And if you look at today's world, that is what we need so, so much nowadays. And I think for primary healthcare, there is an important opportunity there, and it will automatically enhance the quality. The other thing is that I think we should work together and create networks of South-South North cooperation where we support the training of family doctors and other disciplines, community health workers and so on uh, in the South, but also in, in, in of course, in, in Asia, in Latin America and, and so on. Uh, we have now 25 years experience in Africa uh, with the Prima Famed Network. And I can tell you it pays off. It's uh, the, the South South network is now completely independent and they really are, are trying uh, to, to, they continue in developing and scaling up their capacity. And I think uh, if I've seen all the figures of today, I think this is a strategic way that we have to go forward. And I hope that we can work together internationally 
to enable and facilitate this kind of South-South networks for development of human resources for primary health care and family medicine. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Jan on, on many levels, and, and it's one of the reasons we've created some patient-reported outcome measures, one specifically the person-centered primary care measure. A lot of the trust is, is, a, is a fruit of relationship, and, and relationship is really tied to the high value functions of primary care that I think Jeff laid out so well and that and that PHCPI actually declared as quality measures, you know, continuity, comprehensiveness, care coordination, first contact. And, and we have actually in the United States been working to turn those into measures because we think the current list of measures that we have in the United States are driving our physicians to distraction and actually taking away from relationship and, and taking away from trust by forcing people to be too focused on clinical measures. Um, and so we're trying to displace those. But I guess my question to Shams is also to Jeff, how do we reconcile the, the toolkit, which I'm, I'm naively exploring and, and seeing mostly as process and structure to help people wherever they are implement quality programs. How do we link that back to PHCPI and the quality measures and, and the, the high value functions of primary care that are just so essential they should really trump anything else in terms of implementation? Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So first, um, just a, a reaction to, to Jan's point. Uh, they're both excellent interventions. So first of all, I think somehow the domains of quality are often not understood by those that you would expect to be understanding it. So really focusing in on clinical effectiveness, patient safety and people-centeredness as a triad of initial intent within quality of Everyone care efforts. Needs access to healthcare. But, but just because a patient has been treated, it doesn't mean their condition will... Somebody's uh, clicking on that video. That's a, that's, that's, good. that's a good sign. That's not a bad sign. That's a good sign. Um, but I, I think that's it's it's a really important point with, um, related to capacity building, clinical services, and policy and advocacy that Jeff that you made. Um, it's the third element that often gets missed out in terms of the advocacy side, and they, somehow making sure that we are clearly articulating what quality of care is to non-technical folks with an emphasis on people-centeredness is really important. And this is, I suppose, where the three interrelated components of primary healthcare really come in, because it's the community engagement and the empowerment side that links very closely with the people-centeredness. And I'd go a little bit further even, Jan, to focusing in on the importance of compassion within the fo focus on people-centeredness. So really thinking about um, the concept of compassion being awareness of suffering and empathy with that suffering and action to alleviate that suffering. And that action to alleviate that suffering is really the heart of quality of care. Um, on, I've just put something on the chat related to South-South stuff, which would be perhaps of, of use uh, to your efforts, Jan. Um, and uh, Bob, your point is very well taken. In terms of all WHO efforts on measurement as it pertains to quality of care, the quality toolkit will be continuously updated. It is a quality toolkit that's focusing in on WHO technical resources, but it is um, continuously updated. So every quarter there'll be an update cycle on that one. Um, and we would be very keen to ensure that all colleagues um, are, um, yeah, are aware of those, of those updates. I will also share um, the initial orientation webinar on the quality toolkit, which may also be of help. Thanks. Please, Jeff. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Bob, uh, that's a great question. I saw your post to the, the listserv the other day and, and started diving down the rabbit hole of your, your paper and some of the things that were tied to that. Um, you know, I think to the uh, quality uh, toolkit, you know, it's it's incredibly important to have WHO putting that um, out front and forward. Um, you know, my my initial search through it is is unsurprisingly um, that 
those core primary care elements we talked about still remain a gap in the tools that are in there as I sort of search for those elements that those aren't there yet. I expect as WHO starts to put out some of these collection tools related to the indicator and frameworks, we'll start to get those elements. But it is really important that we don't conflate um, health system quality improvement with primary health care quality improvement because they really are different things. And I think, it, you know, primary care service, primary health care service delivery has really been uh, and remains a neglected area until we get those those tools available. You know, to your question about the process measure piece, you know, it's interesting. I was looking at the the person centered primary care measure and uh, I think no doubt it, it, it's an effective measure of um, the performance of the system. And I think then my question I had as I was looking at it was similar to the question I was sort of posing here, which is, okay, now what? Like, how does that help us now make changes for improvement? You know, a, a number of those those things we know, okay, um, your doctor practice isn't standing up for you or, you know, my practice is helping me to stay healthy. Okay, what's the, the process improvement that's necessary now to get that to the place where we need it to be? And so I think we can't be looking at just outcomes based, just process based. We need to bring these elements together. And the, and the process is different for low middle income countries than it is for high income countries. You know, I think our rubric, and you know, one of the things we acknowledge at PHCPI was our rubric one to four doesn't end at four. Um, we chose those one to four because we thought that was about as far as most low and middle income countries were getting on the progression, but it probably goes to five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And I think OECD countries tend to be higher up on that scale and they need their own sort of blueprint for where that needs to go and, and take them. But I think we need to figure out how to bring those, those two elements together. You know, what are the process measures that are gonna go along with that patient-centered primary care measure that help us make the decision about what to do now? Yes, um, thank you, Florian. I'd just like to ask a, a quick question. If someone could respond, uh, uh, I think it was Jeff and probably uh, Shams also right, uh, commented on the community as, uh, and the community health workers as, as a key part of improved quality in primary health care. And I just like you to, to please uh, uh, discuss that in a little bit more detail, uh, what you're thinking about that. And, um, and also just generally community participation in the management of, of primary health care services as well. Thank you. Or Florian, can I just quickly? I'll, just, I'll, I'll have to run, but I just yes, I, thank I, you. that's such a that's an enticing question. That I'm, so, no, thank you for bringing this up. Um, not to make everything about the quality tool here, but the point that you're making is an incredibly important one. If you look at each of the parts of the quality toolkit, there's a a focus on engagement mechanisms, national, subnational facility, and in the in the wider community. So, and that also allows us to identify missing tools that we need and don't exist. So coming back to this point that Jeff was making, there are actually engagement processes that require tools that WHO may not have issued as yet. So that's another aspect that is uh, um, in development. Now, this also uh, or focuses in on the relational aspect the focus on relational community engagement, the human interaction that is the basis upon which primary healthcare is, um, is developed. So that is just a call out to the importance that WHO is placing on the subject and the fact that th those tools will be populated into the future. But having said that, there of course is a huge amount of work that already exists one of the areas in terms of healthcare worker performance that um, Alex Rowe and colleagues at CDC have done um, an extensive work on is the linkages between quality of care and, health, uh, and um, health worker performance. So that's another piece of information, of course, not sitting within WHO, but there is a, an interactive, data, interactive database on that that I'm sure we can find a way to share through the network, Florian. So I just wanted to also 
flag that and particularly the expertise of Alex Rowe coming out from, from CDC. Um, but thank you so much, guys. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and maybe just to add my two cents on the, the community health worker perspective, you know, I think, as I said, I really see those as two ends of the spectrum. And I think that um, my my point in that is that I don't think you have a complete health system if you don't have both of those areas functioning well. So community health workers, um, they we need folks that can provide that comprehensive frontline care. I think we saw in the U.S. during the pandemic, um, you know, it, it, our lack of any kind of meaningfully integrated community um, based um, in home based health delivery um, really hurt us in our ability to bring um, population based health approaches um, and public health based uh, approaches to the population during um, the pandemic. It, it really hurt us incredibly. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think uh, too often we're investing dollars in um, single issue community health workers or community health workers that aren't being adequately trained and uh, monet um, monetarily compensated for their work um, in a way that that um, makes this a true profession for them. Um, and they need somebody that also is available to back them up and provide um, the referral source and support for their work when they find something that is out of the ordinary and doesn't fit into the um, routine types of um, health issues that they're um, competent for taking on. And so having somebody that they can send those patients to really becomes critical as well. So, you know, I, I think it just becomes a, we need both, we can't have one or the other, we really need both. Yeah, thank you a lot for your comment. Um, I would have a question which is now probably a bit more for Bob because Jeff already answered it in his presentation somehow and also in his comments. Um, Bob, based on your perspective, what are the most important things we should be actually measuring in primary healthcare? Well, I think I think PHCPI and, and Jeff's presentation lay those out very well. Um, I do think we need some patient reported outcome measures to keep us kind of honest about how our patients are experiencing care and how they're developing trust. But continuity and comprehensiveness seem to be particularly important. And it's not just important, I think, to measure them at the clinician level, but also to move them up into the practice and health system level. So the system is also being accountable and supporting continuity at the practice level. And, and we're actually working with some of our accountable care organizations to take that kind of system level or um, ownership of continuity and not just make it a, a burden or a requirement of the physicians that are in the frontline practice. Because I think that's the kind of um, support that's going to need to be in place, the kind of accountability that's going to need to be in place uh, to realize true continuity. The uh, My own practice, our health system has been pushing a measure for number of new patients per month, which was really about driving volume and, and getting patients into higher, higher paying services in the hospital rather than trying to build relationships and care. And uh, it, we're, we're trying to communicate to them that this would actually destroy continuity and probably uh, affect trust in a negative way. So I, I'm a big fan of the PHCPI quality measures for that reason. Yeah, my question probably to both of you, but maybe I will start with Bob as he, as he was coming later on today. Um, it's clear that these measures concerning, for example, continuity and comprehensiveness, as you said, are really important clinically for the healthcare system. Um, why is it actually useful to measure them? So what do you see like real world outcomes or changes by the act of measuring these important indicators. Uh, well, I, I think if we don't if we don't measure it, we won't work at changing it or improving it. And um, our assumptions about whether they exist is is drastically overrated. Um, so I, I think that the organizations who actually measured and track it, and, and as I found, there are certain organizations that have posted their quality scores publicly online, I'm, I'm actually responding to Laura's comment here, the ones who are actually measuring it and posting it publicly are the ones who follow it most closely. Um, 
they just feel that much accountability to it and they work very hard to sustain it. And uh, I think that's why it's important to measure it. The second one I alluded to in the last comment, um, it's important because then systems have ownership and develop the policies and the supports for it at the frontline clinician level. So I think those are the two really driving reasons to do it. And I, I might add, you know, these things aren't necessarily easy to measure, right? I mean, I think the, the continuity components in particular and, you know, um, Bob and I were chatting on the side about, I think the, the challenges in, in managing both access and continuity and, and trying to be true to both. You know, I, I was just at a facility today where, um, you know, community health center that's really dealing with a just overwhelming number of new patients that they just don't have the capacity to handle and is in the US as a federally qualified community health center, they have to see everybody who comes regardless. And so they have to find some way to do it. And so, you know, one of the big solutions is they're going to they're going to develop a big new acute care center. Um, so that is no question going to address uh, patient concern about immediate access that they're not getting. Um, but we also know that you know, all those quality elements we're talking about are, are missing for those patients that are a one and done, don't have a continuity relationship with either a provider or the facility. Um, and, it, and it's really critical that you continue to pay attention to both of those things as you put these kinds of uh, systems in place. Yeah, thank you a lot. Um, another question I would have is concerning funding. Um, what do you see, maybe Jeff or maybe both of you, what are the challenges around funding initiat initiatives like yours, like PHCPI? Yeah, I, um, I know Bob's going to have a good answer for this, I think, in terms of um, uh, U.S. approaches, at least the um, your piece about the Massachusetts uh, effort, I think, is worth sharing. Um, you know, globally, uh, you know, I think that the World Bank has made clear that they see some of these um, elements as being important, particularly on the workforce area. Um, however, um, they, you know, really will only invest in what countries ask for, and um, it's imperative on countries to um, to be coming to the table with those requests, um, and they need the data to be able to do that, right? It's hard to I mean, they, honestly, countries often know what they need, um, but uh, I think everybody's more comfortable when they come to the table with uh, evidence base that supports the, the requests they're coming in with. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly, I think we're seeing, you know, interesting efforts from groups like the Global Fund that are really trying to request um, health system strengthening requests as part of their work related to the um, three primary diseases in their purview, um, including um, ways to improve primary health care. The problem is none of the right people are in the room for those conversations. So the, the people who are in the room for making those requests are the same people who've always been in the room, who are the um, folks that are empowered um, within the systems that are focused on those three diseases, which is understandable given that that's the focus of the organization. But if you really want to be able to reach out into new areas, you need to find champions for health system strengthening of primary health care, bring those people into the room so that they can help those groups develop meaningful um, requests coming from the country for what they need for improvement. Um, and I guess the last thing I would mention is I think you're beginning to see a little bit of movement at USAID. Um, you know, the US Congress has not um, included primary health care as a, a priority on um, U.S. global health aid, but you do see Atul Gawande trying to make some efforts working with the missions to try and find ways to, to measure elements of primary care service delivery and I think particularly integrated care uh, or comprehensive care as we think about it um, and, and how that might be able to help um, address some of the other disease-based needs. Jeff, I'm curious which Massachusetts article you were referring to. Uh, well, you were talking about the bicameral uh, effort for um, for trying to change the way that we're measuring primary health care, and, and of course that does uh, link to funding. No, absolutely, you're right. Um, yeah, the, in the health affairs article, we point to the Massachusetts effort to allow primary care to have a a, a different set of measures that are more aligned with the PC, PCP. PHCPI 
um, quality measures. Sorry, I'm just I'm just today recovering from COVID finally, so I'm getting my voice back. Um, yeah, I, if we have to do it through legislation, we have to do it through legislation. Um, we're trying to do it through Medicare right now. Um, we've managed to get continuity in the PC, PCM in, endorsed as um, core quality measures uh, for payers and for employers to use, but we, we are really struggling to get continuity and comprehensiveness through the process that Medicare uses for endorsing measures. Um, the con comprehensiveness, because they don't believe that primary care does comprehensive care any longer, but continuity because um, they refuse to let us use uh, claims-based measures. So measuring patients' experiences across all settings, uh, but they don't like it when we use an EHR drive measure because it's only within setting. So we can't get past the bureaucratic uh, processes for uh, getting endorsement, but we, we keep trying. And um, that health affairs article is really kind of a shot across the bow to say, look, we really have to rethink how we're measuring the high value functions of primary care. And at least in the US, you know, legislation is how we've moved towards um, something closer to universal health coverage for sure. Um, you know, so um, the, the technocrats are important, but um, so are politicians. Thank you a lot. Is there another question from the audience? Yeah, thank you a lot then. And have a good evening or a good night or a good afternoon, wherever you are at the moment. Yeah, thank you again. Great group of people here today, for sure. Thank you so much, Florian.